I wanted to just run through this evening just a, a little bit of background on environmental impact assessment. I do understand that there seems to be a bit of a range of knowledge on planning and, and other issues. So I will try and keep this sort of as, as accessible as, as possible. Um, one thing I, I should probably start off by saying is that um, I am actually an environmental generalist. So essentially a specialist project manager. Um, I suppose part and parcel of my role is to understand probably 80% of a whole host of different technical topics that feed into EIA. So I have to hold my hands up and say I'm not a qualified ecologist, although I would like to think I know a decent amount about ecology, the same with contaminated land, flood risk and everything else. So I just wanted to start by just giving a very quick overview of what environmental impact assessment is for those that aren't aware. So really the purpose of it is to make sure that in deciding a planning application, a local authority, um, in this case Bucks Council, um, can, can take a decision on that application in the full knowledge of its likely significant environmental effects. So EIA is essentially a regulated process, uh, one of the few that actually are as, as part of planning. Um, and in this case, for the Marlow Film Studio, the um, applicable EIA regulations are the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations, um, which were I mean, uh, back from two, 2017. Now, there's a whole host of, there's about 15 to 20 sets of EIA regulations, I think, covering a, a huge amount of different, different areas, but these are the ones that are applicable in this case. Um, now, I, I haven't got time to dwell too much on the process, but the first stage of EIA is screening, i.e. determining whether or not a development requires EIA. Um, so it won't be any surprise to hear that projects like nuclear power stations, um, large hydroelectric uh, dams and things, for those types of schemes, EIA is mandatory, and they're called Schedule 1 developments. Uh, Marlow Film Studio, uh, falls under a Schedule 2 development. So EIA is required for those developments where they're likely to have the potential for significant environmental effects. And that first stage is to establish with a local authority whether or not EIA should be undertaken. Um, but I'd like to point out in this case that uh, DPR um, have actually volunteered to undertake EIA. So we kind of skipped that first stage with Bucks Council and we've gone straight into a process of EIA scoping. So if you could just move on to the next slide. So scoping really is once you've established that EIA is either going to be volunteered for a project or is required for a project, um, it's, a, it's not a mandatory stage of EIA, although it is obviously considered best practice. And the idea of scoping is that it aims to focus the environmental impact assessment on key issues. Um, such that you've got a document that's sat in front of planning officers that isn't ram full of it, information that isn't necessarily pertinent to the decision they're taking. Um, and that request for a scoping opinion, as it's called, or the scoping report, uh, which you might have heard about through some of the recent press releases, was submitted to um, Bucks Council on the 26th of July this year. The process with scoping is that Bucks then have a period of five weeks, typically, to consult with a range of statutory consultees and non-statutory consultees. So the statutory consultees being Natural England, the Environment Agency. Sorry, bear with me one second. Sorry, I'm, I'm just getting over a cold, so I didn't want to cough in everybody's ear. Um, so it's Natural England, the Environment Agency and Historic England, and then a range of other non-statutory consultees. So the likes of, um, in this case, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. So the, the local authority receive that request. They pass it around all their internal departments, planning, environmental health, etc. They... Um, send it out to a range of other consultees and ask for their comments on the proposed scope of the EIA. Um, and then the scoping opinion comes back um, and it's actually part of the regulations that the environmental statement must be based on the scoping opinion that's received. Um, and as I say, that takes into account the views of all of the, the council's technical officers, etc. So in this case, 
obviously it's a, it's a large application. Um, we, we, we've touched on the point of engaging with the, the council earlier, um, but they have turned around and asked for an extension of time in order to, to get their opinion together, uh, which DPL have granted. So we're actually expecting their formal opinion back on the 24th of September. Um, and as I mentioned, the environmental statement, which is essentially the product of the EIA process, um, will then need to be based on that scoping opinion. So there are already responses that have been received from um, a range of stakeholders, uh, including Natural England and the Wildlife Trust, and they are being uploaded onto the Council's planning portal and are accessible to anybody that wants to go and read them. Um, but very quickly, uh, I just wanted to run through the, the issues that, um, in the opinion of the professional consultant team, should be scoped into the EIA and out of the EIA. Um, so the issues to be scoped in, transport and access, air quality, climate change, greenhouse gases, um, noise and vibration, uh, ground conditions and contamination, and then flood risk and drainage, uh, ecology, uh, historic environment, which includes typically includes archaeology and built heritage, um, so Westhorpe House being a, a listed building, for instance, um, but in this case is is more associated with uh, built heritage on the basis that lots of the site has, um, as um, mentioned earlier, been uh, quarried and landfilled, um, and then finally landscape and vision effects. Um, in terms of the issues to be scoped out, now this is this is not to say that there will be no documentation that's submitted alongside the planning application to cover these issues, because for instance, in the case of daylight, sunlight and overshadowing, there will be a report that accompanies the planning application that looks on at the, the potential effects of the development on nearby residences. Um, but the issues that we propose to scope out of the environmental statement on the basis they're unlikely on the, of, on the basis of what we know at the moment to be significant are um, waste and minerals, uh, daylight, sunlight and overshadowing, uh, solar glare, wind microclimate, uh, which is typically associated with much taller buildings in a much more urbanized environment. Um, human health, although that is not to say that human health wouldn't be considered within the environmental statement because some of the, um, the criteria that that say air quality, noise, and ground conditions and contamination are based on come out of uh, World Health Organization standards and they're all there to protect human health essentially. So by, by scoping out human health, what I mean is that there wouldn't be a, necessarily a standalone chapter on that um, and that we'd be signposting within the environmental statement to, um, sorry, We'd be signposting in the environmental statement to where that is considered. Um, arboriculture is one issue, and another issue where there will be, so we, we've undertaken tree surveys, there will be an arboricultural impact assessment that's submitted alongside the planning application, but typically arboriculture isn't covered by, by EIA, although will be referenced within the ecology chapter. Um, agricultural soils, and then finally, risk of major accidents and disasters. And um, again, uh, because the EIA regulations cover such a broad range of developments, there are obviously those that are uh, more likely to result in major accidents and disasters than um, a commercial development such as the one being put forward. Um, if you could just quickly go to the next slide. So obviously we're at an early stage. Um, lots of um, baseline studies have been undertaken. So that includes a range of desk-based assessments. Um, so actually going and getting hold of ecological data from the local biological record center, um, all of the record data from the historic environmental record, um, which relates to archeology span and, and listed buildings. Um, and then we've done a range of um, on-site assessment work um, and survey work, which really is part of this iterative process. So the idea of EIA is that you go and you identify what's on the site. That then feeds into um, the work that Jason and Pryors are doing in terms of setting the development out. So obviously the, the best way of reducing environmental effects is to avoid those areas that are most sensitive. Um, 
And so I just wanted to, to spend five minutes just running through some of the survey work um, that's been undertaken by the technical team to date. Um, so if you just move on to the next one. So the first one um, is traffic surveys. And I think, you know, the point has been, been made earlier this evening about the fact that um, we are not looking to have a development that people can only access by a private car. Um, that actually consideration is being given to pedestrian and cycling, cycling links, um, public transport, such as bus services, um, utilizing the, you know, other connections. Um, but just in terms of the traffic um, surveys that have been undertaken, there's been a range of uh, automated traffic counts that were undertaken at the end of June and early July at the point that Bucks Council confirmed that they would start to accept traffic survey data again, because obviously with COVID and lockdown, um, you have seen a reduction in terms of traffic flows. Um, so those, those were undertaken then, um, and they were out for um, 24 hours a day for, for a period of one week over weekday and weekend. Um, and then there were also a series of manual classified counts, which are the ones shown in white um, on, the, on the screen here, um, which are looking at uh, queue data and um, were actually have people sat at those junctions counting the number of vehicles that were doing specific movements and queue lengths and things like that. Um, as I say, there has been some consultation with officers at Bucks Council already on um, certain issues. There has been a little bit of a hold up with getting a formalized meeting schedule with those officers, uh, but they have been engaging with us on the, the timings of surveys and things. Um, next slide, please. Um, the next one is air quality monitoring. So we've been monitoring since June this year, and that's going to run for a period of six months up till November. Um, and we've been monitoring at the five locations shown on the screen there. Um, again, it's a little bit tricky to pick up, but um, if you could see my, my arrow hovering over those points. Um, and we've gone out and laid um, diffusion tubes to look for nitrogen dioxide levels, um, principally along the A404 and uh, Marlow Road, um, but also picking up down at the southern end of the site near the, the railway line. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the other surveys that's been undertaken, obviously, is noise, and I think this was shown on some of Jason's slides earlier. Um, and we've done a mixture of um, attended and unattended surveys. Um, so those were undertaken, the first set of surveys was undertaken back in April this year, which from an environmental point of view actually provides almost a worst case condition because traffic uh, levels are lower than typical. Um, so those surveys will be used to um, put together a 3D noise model um, and that will then be used to inform outside um, activities and the potential effects of those on nearby sensitive receptors, such as residential units. Um, so the surveys found that the, the noise climate was really dominated by road noise, unsurprisingly, but also trains, um, airplanes, and then jet skis and water sports that are taking place on, on those lakes. Um, and then the short, the attended measurement locations, which are shown in blue on the screen, were really done over a, a period of a, a day or two, and they're used really to assist with the uh, calibration of the, the noise model and the equipment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so obviously one of the key issues with the site having previously been used for landfilling will be the ground investigation. Um, there have been previous investigations that have taken place on the site and part of the, the desk-based element of the work that the team's been undertaking was to uh, review a whole range of historic maps, um, all of the data that was available from previous site investigations that had taken place on the site. And then they went and designed a, a further site investigation in consultation with the um, environmental health officer at Bucks Council. Um, and there was an attempt to engage with um, the Environment Agency on the, the scope of that work, but they um, declined to declined to comment at that stage due again to resourcing issues. Um, but the 
the further ground investigation, which was complete, I think about a week and a half ago, um, consisted of 25 uh, trial pits, um, 19 boreholes, um, up to a depth of about 30 metres, um, and then three window samples. And the idea behind the ground investigation was to record um, the condition of the material in the ground. Um, we are also, over the course of the next three months, doing um, ground gas and then ground water and surface water monitoring so that it's not just taken from a, a two week period with those um, with those things you, you, you tend to measure it over a, a longer period of time and that will inform um, things like the cut and fill balance within the site um, it will also inform whether or not there are um, specific foundation solutions that are going to be required whether there are ground gas protection measures that are required under any of the buildings. Um, so lots of um, those samples have now been sent off to the lab for um, analysis and those results are, are just, in, just starting to come back to us now. Um, thank you. And then just a, a very quick one on viewpoint photography. Um, so landscape and visual effects are obviously going to be a key consideration. Um, we've heard earlier about the, the um, positioning of the site in with regards to the area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, so what's shown up on screen um, are the, the key views that have been identified by uh, Gillespie's who are undertaking the, la the landscape and visual impact assessment work. I've only put one of the photos up because otherwise it, it kind of uh, stop being able to see any of the, the rest of the slide. But the pink areas that are highlighted are a theoretical zone of visibility. So the way that that's done is you, you take um, a model of the surrounding area, you put in a notional height of a building, uh, which you will know from um, other film studios. Um, and what that gives you is a, is a plan that shows from which areas this development will be visible, taking into account topography and, uh, and intervening vegetation. And then what the um, landscape assessors have done, have, have gone out with that zone of theoretical visibility, and they've tried to get a range of viewpoints from kind of um, near, middle and distant views um, from you know, a, a variety of, of locations. Um, the viewpoint photography was undertaken in January this year, um, and there's been some further photography take, undertaken over the summer months as well. But usually it's winter photography that's used to undertake these assessments because obviously the leaves are off the trees and it, it provides a, a kind of a worst case assessment um, from, a, from a landscape and visual point of view. Um, and then on the ecology survey front, which is obviously featured quite heavily, there's been um, a huge amount of survey work that's been undertaken throughout the course of this year. Indeed, some of it extends back into the, the back half of last year. Um, so I've just stuck up on uh, the slide there the, the um, species that have been surveyed for. Um, so we've undertaken uh, a couple of different types of um, habitat survey. We've surveyed for reptiles, uh, water vole and otter, uh, badgers, uh, breeding and wintering birds. So the wintering bird surveys were actually undertaken over the course of the back end of last year and early into this year. Um, excuse me one second. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we've also undertaken a, a lot of different types of bat um, surveys, so bat activity surveys, um, Surveys using automated bat detectors, which are essentially stuck out in the field and record over a, a long period of time. We've done some emergent surveys on buildings that were identified um, as having potential to support bat roofs. Um, and there's also been a series of aerial inspections on trees that, um, again, have been identified as being uh, as potentially containing bat roosts. We've then done some invertebrate surveys, both terrestrial and aquatic, and the aquatic um, surveys are being undertaken um, over the course of the next month or so. The terrestrial surveys were undertaken earlier in the year. We've done um, eDNA surveys for great crested newts. So this is a, a relatively new technique, probably been around, I guess, two or three years now, um, which was designed to um, kind of cut down on the survey effort that was needed for great crested newts because they are quite difficult to survey usually but 
essentially you test for great new uh, great crested newt dna within water bodies and we have um surveyed 11 different ponds um and then the final one is the fish survey um and actually obviously with a member of the angling club um on the the group this evening um there may be some useful information that you could provide to us um, on top of the, the, the actual survey work that we're undertaking. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the final area I wanted to touch upon was um, biodiversity net gain. Now, this is an area that, you know, I think watermen uh, have a real strength in. So we've been, we've been working in net gain for, for quite some time. Um, and actually one of the biodiversity toolkits that we um, developed on behalf of Barclay Homes um, featured in the DEFRA consultation document on mandating biodiversity net gain. Um, so that is likely to become a requirement through uh, the Environment Act. So as many of you know, the Environment Bill is actually being considered in Parliament at the moment. We believe the requirement is going to be for 10% biodiversity net gain to be achieved on um, sites that are being brought forward for development. Um, although, you know, as mentioned in um, Jason's presentation earlier, obviously biodiversity and ecology are key pillars of, of this particular scheme. So um, they are targeting 20% uh, biodiversity net gain um, with as much being achieved within the red line boundary as possible. And then potentially um, looking at uh, enhancing um, offsite areas. So the the method used to do biodiversity net gain, it's, it's actually developed quite a bit. And uh, the new metric was released by DEFRA back in July this year, um, which is metric 3.0. So just very quickly wanted to touch upon the way that you actually calculate net gain. Um, so if you just go to the next slide, please. Um, so it's really done through a, a calculation of um, the area of a habitat, um, the distinctiveness of the habitat, uh, a, an assessment of its condition, and then an assessment of its strategic significance. Um, and it's a sort of as shown on the slide there, it's kind of a, a factor of all of those things that um, allows you to work out how many habitat units you actually have existing on a site. Um, so obviously through the surveys that uh, the ecologists have been out and done, they have looked at um, the habitats that are present on the site, uh, what their condition is in, um, and then the strategic significance. And I think this comes back to um, the fact that part of the site um, is covered by the um, biological, biological notification site, um, which actually um, factors, so it's the Marlow gravel pits by the biological notification site and the factor that's applied to that is more than the factor that is applied to areas that are outside of that um, particular designation albeit it is a local designation not statutory designation um, and then just moving on to the final slide is really there it doesn't come up particularly well on my screen um, but the final slide was just put in there to give you an idea about how these calculations actually work so it's essentially an enormous excel spreadsheet that allows you to record the area of, of habitat, which is done through um, the surveys and the use of geographic information systems, the distinctiveness, uh, the condition, the strategic significance, and then that gives you your baseline unit score. And then the net gain is achieved by looking at what's lost as a result of a development coming forward, um, and then what landscaping is being put in, so that might be through um, additional planting, it might be green roofs on buildings, um, such that you can um, also calculate what the the end unit score is, if you like, so after the development's in place, and that allows you to do a, a calculation of what your net gain is. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that was a very quick run through, but I'll throw it back to Steve um, 